Talk about bad press. This Oscar-winning movie diva ruled Hollywood in the 1930s and 40s. But after her death in 1977, Joan Crawford's name was dragged through the mud. Mommy dearest, ring a bell? Wire coat hangers? Joan Crawford's adopted daughter, Christina, wrote her scathing bestseller in 1978, and Hollywood turned the story into the famous camp classic starring Faye Dunaway. Ever since, people have been both fascinated and horrified by the outrageous behavior of one of Tinseltown's biggest stars. This movie queen is now remembered not for her acting or her beauty, but for being a drunk, deranged, child-abusing meat freak. And as if that weren't enough to tarnish Joan Crawford's tiara, rumors of pornography and prostitution continue to plague her memory. Hooray for Hollywood, huh? On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll expose the secrets of a Hollywood film goddess. The rumor is that she had been a call girl on the side and did what a lot of chorus girls had to do. But, of course, there are all those rumors about the porno flick. Joan Crawford loved that. I've never come across such an aggressive uh, woman. And we'll hear what life was really like with Mommy from Joan's daughter, Christina. Her anger, her rage, her frustration was taken out directly on me and then no wire hangers and the temper tantrums. I saw that. If that was her, Joan would do that. Joan was not the mother of the year, God knows. What I didn't like about her was her attitude. There's a shocker, a movie star with attitude. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we examine one of Hollywood's most bizarre real-life characters, the tormented and sometimes demented Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford died quietly in her New York City apartment at the age of 72. In her final years, Crawford was a virtual recluse. To this day, her death in 1977 is shrouded in mystery. Did Joan stage her own final exit? Biographer Karen Swenson. Some people felt that Joan had taken some medication, perhaps sleeping pills, in order to commit suicide. Also, she gave away uh, her dog that she adored uh, about a week or so before this. Director Vincent Sherman was a close friend and one-time lover. When they found her, she was dead in her bed, but every, she was well-dressed and everything was laid out nicely and so forth. So um, the real truth of her death, I don't know whether we will ever know. But the question is, will we ever know the real truth about Crawford's life? Much of her story is tainted with wild rumor and innuendo. So how much is true and how much is just Hollywood dirt? Well, let's start from the beginning. Joan Crawford was born in San Antonio, Texas on March 23rd, 1905. She's the daughter of Thomas Lesseur and Annabelle Johnson. Her parents split up shortly after her birth. Little Lucille didn't see her father again until decades later, long after she became Joan Crawford. In 1918, Anna, Lucille, and her older brother Hal all moved to Kansas City, Missouri to get a fresh start. Anna took the first job she could find. She ran the uh, Gate City Laundry on 9th Street downtown. They had an apartment right behind the dry cleaners. This is the genesis of where Joan Crawford's obsession about wire hangers came from. Biographer Bob Thomas knew Joan Crawford for more than 30 years. No wire hangers. I mean, uh, that became a camp joke, and uh, Mommy Dearest became a cult movie. But we'll get to Mommy Dearest a little later. The fact remains that Joan Crawford did not have a happy childhood. Things got even worse in 1919 when 14-year-old Joan entered Rockingham Academy, a private school in Kansas City. It was one of those work-study relationships where she basically worked for her room and board there, and the uh, headmistress was quite brutal with her. I believe she was beaten. After four miserable years, Joan graduated from the Academy in 1923. Joan Crawford heard about a show that was doing auditions and they were looking for a chorus girl. She knew this is what she wanted to do and she would do anything to get out of Kansas City. Anything? It was rumored that Joan Crawford did a porno film in Kansas City. Frankly, I just don't see Joan Crawford being desperate enough to do a porno film. Then in 1924, 19-year-old Joan was hired by a traveling dance troupe. One of the first cities Joan performed in was Detroit. When she was working there at one of the clubs, Joan Crawford was allegedly uh, arrested for prostitution. 
there's no way of, of checking the records. If Joan was arrested for hooking, no records were ever found, but the rumors persist. By the end of 1924, Joan had managed to dance, or whatever, her way to New York City where she became a Broadway chorus girl. It was in New York that the beautiful 19-year-old got her big break. And she was discovered by MGM, and they didn't think a great deal of her. Well, studio execs thought enough of her to give her a screen test and buy her a train ticket to Hollywood in 1925. She started there in silent movies, but she was just playing the role of a flapper. After a year of playing bit parts, the chorus girl, who still went by the name Lucille Lassure, was finally noticed by MGM Brass. The first order of business, Lucille needed a new name, writer Jimmy Bangley. They had um, a publicity stunt that Metro Goldwyn Mayer had, name the star. So the first winning name was Joan Arden, and a woman came up and said, I am Joan Arden. So they took the second choice, and from that contest, and that was Joan Crawford. And she hated it. She goes, oh my God, it sounds like crawfish. But of course, the name Joan Crawford became a part of Hollywood history, a history that included many career triumphs, but also four marriages, countless affairs, and a battle with the bottle. Just ahead, an exclusive interview with Christina Crawford, author of Mommy Dearest. This weekend on E, if you're feeling lost... In 1925, former chorus girl Joan Crawford was just another bit player at MGM. The 20-year-old Joan was sexy and vivacious and starting to create some buzz at the studio. But Joan was also extremely ambitious, and she decided that the quickest way to become a queen of Hollywood was to find herself a king. So in 1928, fate gave her a hand when Joan was cast opposite Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in a film called Our Modern Mate. Fairbanks fell hard for his co-star, and the romance between Crawford and Fairbanks got a lot of ink. Joan had accomplished her goal. There was a very well thought out plan, I think, in marrying Doug Fairbanks Jr. Marrying him meant a step up in the social world of Hollywood. 25-year-old Joan Crawford married Douglas Fairbanks Jr. on June 3rd, 1929. This marvelous wedding between a member of the royal family of Hollywood. And here was this former chorus girl who was brought into the family. But family life just wasn't Joan's style. By the time he found out I was a homegirl, homegirl. <laughs> in 1931, Crawford starred in the first in a string of films opposite America's favorite sex symbol, Clark Gable. It wasn't long before Joan had eyes for her co-star. The appeal of Clark Gable was too much. And they were, you know, appearing in film after film. And uh, uh, Doug found out that Joan was getting home later and later from work. And, uh, finally, he discovered that his wife and Clark Gable were having a little tussle in the hay after the shooting day. Joan divorced Fairbanks in 1933, but her career was on the fast track. Crawford had more than 25 films under her shoulder pad and was doing very big box office. She made her way up, though, and she was very popular, especially in the films in which she co-starred with Clark Gable. The Crawford-Gable affair fizzled though they remained friends and sometimes lovers until Gable's death. In the meantime, Joan Crawford was a full-fledged movie star by 1933 when she starred in a film called Today We Live. And guess what? Crawford became involved with one of her co-stars, a Broadway actor by the name of Francho Tone. The two married in 1935, and some suggest Joan was working an angle with this marriage as well. Marrying Francho Tone meant a step up in the cultural world because Francho Tone had been a member of of the group theater with intellectual and artistic accomplishments. So uh, that advanced her in another uh, field. But Joan was suddenly faced with a career catastrophe. Jane Ardmore was a close friend of Crawford. After she had married Frank Chotone, and they were at the uh, Waldorf, she got a telephone call from these people offering to sell her this stag film. And she had them call someone at the studio. They saw the film. And it wasn't Joan. This was a very successful scam in, in the early 30s, blackmailing the stars in the studios uh, over any kind of thing, sexual or drug-oriented. And I believe that Joan Crawford was the victim of that. Louis B. Mayer and one of his assistants saw the film in question and you know, 
basically said, if that's Joan Crawford, I'm Greta Garbo. No porno movie. That's one vicious rumor we can lay to rest. Joan survived the blackmail attempt unscathed, and her career continued to build momentum. Crawford's second marriage, however, was losing steam. Unfortunately for their marriage, she was a, a big star in MGM. He was not. He played some leading roles, but mostly he was the second man in films, including those that starred her. So that marriage didn't last very long. The couple divorced in 1940. Joan, now 35, made the bizarre decision to adopt a child. In those days, single parents were not allowed to adopt, but Joan used her star power to get what she wanted. In the summer of 1940, Joan adopted her daughter Christina when the baby was just a few months old. Joan had taken her out of an adoption agency in Tennessee. Who knows what kind of a life Christina would have had. She may not ever have been adopted. She may have become the daughter of a sharecropper. Not a lot of sharecroppers in Brentwood, but given what we've heard about Christina's childhood, that might have been a nice break. The first few years went pretty smoothly, since Joan had plenty of help taking care of the baby. So now it was time to complete the picture and find a new husband and father for Christina. Two years after the adoption, Joan headed down the aisle. Husband number three was Philip Terry, who was a, a big, handsome guy who was a, a contract actor at RKO. Didn't have a very successful career. He was more or less considered Mr. Joan Crawford. That same year, Joan decided Christina needed a brother. Details about where Christopher Crawford actually came from remain vague. Joan's daughter, Christina Crawford. She actually didn't adopt. She bought children. The only person that was adopted was myself. I'm pretty sure that my brother, Chris, was never adopted. We've never been able to find any papers uh, or birth certificates or anything. Joan divorced husband number three in 1946 and was now alone with two kids. To the press and public, Joan came off like a devoted single mother, but behind closed doors, Crawford was miserable. At 41, Joan was no longer being offered choice roles. Her career was slipping away. Crawford turned to the bottle and the string of lovers for consolation. Straight ahead, the mommy dearest controversy. Was this an accurate portrayal of Joan Crawford's psychotic breakdown? Or is there still more we don't know? It's... By 1946, 41-year-old Joan Crawford was losing her status as a movie queen. In those days, Hollywood was even more unforgiving when it came to age, and Joan's shelf life had expired. I'm A.J. Benza for Mysteries and Scandals. After 15 years at the top, Joan Crawford was suddenly picking through the scrap heap for good scripts, hoping she could find one that would revive her career. And Joan's personal life was not much better. Divorced three times, Crawford was the single mother of two adopted children, Christina and Christopher. Why would an unmarried, self-obsessed movie star adopt children anyway? She used us for publicity because her career was rocky, she wasn't married, and she couldn't get enough publicity to keep her, in a positive sense, in front of her fans and in the public uh, any other way. Jerry Smith was Joan Crawford's secretary. She had these beautiful, lovely children. She would dress them up, you know, and comb their hair and probably never see them again after the photo session. She used us as children to get that positive, warm, loving family feeling across to her, you know, her public. But the publicity just wasn't enough to breathe life back into Joan's career, and Crawford was turning to the bottle to ease her frustration. She walked around with a glass all the time, and I thought it was she was drinking water. I later learned it was vodka. Alcoholism is a way of trying to deal with pain. And I think the, the difficulty of her life and her career created a lot of pain. So it was a very sad situation. It was a dark period for her. Crawford was waiting for that choice script that would put her back on the top. She recognized it in a vehicle called Mildred Pierce. You make me feel, I don't know, warm. And wanted. Joan did feel warm and wanted in 1946 when she won the Academy Award for Mildred Pierce. It's hard to underestimate uh, what Mildred Pierce meant to Joan. Career-wise, things were back on track for a while, but off-screen, life with the star was a living hell. My brother was next, and, and he, he had it as rough as I did. And I tried to protect him. He tried to protect me. We were mostly unsuccessful but it created a bond between us that is still there today. 
and the no wire hangers and the temper tantrums. The, I saw that. That was her. Joan would do that. It's hard to imagine that someone as famous and as celebrated as Joan Crawford was that kind of a mother. I'm glad Joan Crawford wasn't my mother, and I love her. But I think where there's a lot of smoke, there has to be a little fire. And I think that Joan Crawford was abusive to Christina and to Christopher. And it's tragic. And it well, big out. She was a really a terrible mother. She abused these kids. Good night, mother. Good night, mother, dear. Good night, darling. Happy dreams. God bless. I don't believe she had any clue what love really was, and certainly not a clue about the love of a parent for a child. Maybe because she'd never felt that in her own family. I don't think she ever experienced it coming into her life, and she certainly didn't seem to know how to give it to anyone else. In 1949, nine-year-old Christina and seven-year-old Christopher were sent away to separate boarding schools, safe from their mother's wrath. So Joan wasn't winning any PTA awards, but she did have her admirers, most of them men. Despite her 1946 Oscar, Joan's career as a leading lady was slipping away. Her reputation for being difficult and a drunk preceded her. For the next 10 years, after Mildred Pierce, Crawford managed to make a dozen or so pretty forgettable films, but Joan never stopped living like a movie goddess. And then in 1956, Crawford bagged a new husband, a rich one. A husband number four was very interesting. Uh, not an actor this time. Alfred Steele, a giant of Pepsi-Cola. They met at a party, and uh, he was infatuated with her and her glamour, and she with him. The couple eloped to Las Vegas for a quickie marriage in May of 1956. And she became a Mrs. Pepsi-Cola, using her glamour to sell soft drinks. Ahead, more from the Crawford file. What surprises did marriage number four have in store for Joan? and were secret sexual desires at the root of one of Hollywood's most infamous feuds. Well, that's a silly question. If you've already got milk, get out the Hershey syrup. See, now this commercial I like. Oh, yeah. Daily Variety says viewers can't get enough of true Hollywood stories. The E! True Hollywood Story, now on every night at 9, only on E! In 1956, Joan Crawford, by now a fading 51-year-old movie diva, married the CEO of Pepsi-Cola, Alfred Steele. Joan played an active role as wife and promoter, using a star power, or what was left of it, to sell soft drinks. She turned to be a very astute businesswoman and was soon voted onto the board of directors. But three years after their marriage, Alfred Steele died of a heart attack. The widow Crawford remained on the board of Pepsi-Cola for 13 years. However, by 1960, 55-year-old Crawford was, at least in Hollywood terms, a dinosaur. But in 1961, Joan got the chance to co-star in a film opposite her greatest rival in the business, Betty Davis. The film was called Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Crawford and Davis had carried on a well-publicized feud for decades, which naturally spilled over into the production of Betty Davis biographer James Spada. Betty really, really hated Joan Crawford. Joan would do a scene, and the director would yell, cut, and Betty would look at the director and say, is that the way she's going to do it? So what sparked this battle? Well, many observers believe the feud was brought on by years of competition and clashing egos. Well, maybe there's more to the story. There is a, a, a story that Joan Crawford made a, a pass at Betty Davis, and that that was one of the reasons, too, why she had this, this sort of bitterness toward, toward Joan. I don't believe Joan Crawford was a lesbian. She's just much too interested in men. Director Vincent Sherman would probably agree. We were in the projection room alone, and she took my hand, and she put it on her breast. She suddenly got up and uh, pulled up her skirt and took off a pair of panties. She was ready to, uh, you know, for, for sex to, uh, at that particular time. She had a, uh, a reputation for sort of eating men alive. Joan Crawford certainly did have a reputation. She had a controlling and an imperious kind of manner, and it got to be a real royal pain in the butt sometimes. But Crawford was very loyal to her fans. 
Her fans adored her. I mean, what's not to like? She answered every single letter. She wanted to be loved. And I think that's what she tried to extract from everyone that came in contact with her. This is the face of a star. Forty years on the screen cannot dim its luster. She is Joan Crawford, consummate symbol of the movie star. She is her own creation. And they just don't make them like that anymore. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we take a stroll down the flip side of the Hollywood Walk of Fame.